Let's talk for a second about your friend, Justice Ginsburg. I ran into her at the opening night of La Boheme at the Washington National Opera the other night, and she looked uh, terrific and vivacious, and I wonder, do you have a sense of how long she wants to stay in the court? You know, I don't think that uh, she knows the answer to that herself, but I think we should take her at her word mm -hmm. that she intends to do this job as long as she can and do it well. This is her life. Right. The law is her life. The law and her family and her husband is now dead. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should just expect that she's going to do it as long as she can. And she's had cancer twice, but she looks great. Um, she does push-ups, which is more than I can say. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you were uh, at the Supreme Court last Monday. Mm -hmm. for a case that I'm sure is very important to the GA audience, uh, Zivotofsky v. Carey. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have uh, a sense of how that might turn out? Well, I found it somewhat curious in many ways. For anybody that doesn't know, the question is whether an American citizen born in Jerusalem can list on his passport as the place of birth, or not just the place of birth, yeah, as the place of birth, Israel, as opposed to just Jerusalem. And the United States, since the creation of Israel, has taken the position, every president, Republican and Democratic, has taken the position that uh, the final disposition of Jerusalem will be decided in a peace deal, and until then, nobody, can claim ownership, essentially, of, of Jerusalem. So every president has taken the same position. Congress, however, tried to get into the act in 2002 by passing legislation that called for the moving of the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, but it didn't mandate it. What it did mandate was the that the the U.S. passports of people born in Jerusalem should say as their country, uh, Israel, and as the country of their birth as Israel, not just Jerusalem, which is what it had always been. And the Zivotofskis challenged that, uh, challenged the, the State Department has never done it. Uh, George Bush, when he signed the, this was language that was tacked on to a big foreign aid bill. And when, he, when President Bush signed the bill, he said that he considered that provision to be an, an unconstitutional infringement of his foreign policy power and any president's foreign policy power. President Obama has taken the same position, so the State Department doesn't just says on the U.S. passport, says Jerusalem. And the Zivotofskis sued to enforce the language in the statute. So the case was argued three years ago the first time and then sent back to the lower courts. At that argument, interestingly enough, it sounded very much as if the Zivotofskis would lose. At this argument, it sounded very much the other way around. Mm -hmm. And as one of my colleagues put it, the, strange, the really strange part about the argument, it was sort of like the justices, some of the justices were playing diplomat for a day. Justice Kennedy kept asking a question that he'd even written it out, that the passport could say, this passport should not be taken to, con to be construed as endorsing Jerusalem as part of Israel, et cetera, et cetera. But of course there, as the government pointed out, when this legislation passed, there were big demonstrations and violence in Jerusalem over this very legislation. And the government kept warning the court, look, what you do here will have a consequence for, for international relations. And every president has agreed on that, and every president has thought that's not within the power of Congress to do, or for that matter, you to do, as is sort of the unspoken here. But I would say that Certainly, it sounded like at least four justices, and I'm including in that probably uh, 
Justice Thomas, but he doesn't speak. He doesn't ask questions. Um, but at least four justices likely sounded as if they were hostile to that idea. And, and maybe a fifth, and the fifth would be Justice Kennedy. I mean, it was not entirely clear what the other justices thought. Um, but what's odd, particularly odd about it, is that if there is a five justice majority to uphold the congressional statute and say that it does not infringe on the president's powers in an unconstitutional manner, four of those five justices will be people who work for the executive branch mm -hmm. and for years and years spoke about the importance and necessity of uh, a strong exec executive and aggressive sort of powers of the executive. And in those positions, they never would have tolerated the position that they are now contemplating endorsing. So it was, it was pretty interesting. It was that an interesting day. Earlier, when you were interviewing uh, two of the Supremes uh, for us, uh, you asked Justice Kagan about the time she had to argue Citizens United uh, as the Solicitor General. And of course, that case has earned its fair share of detractors in this country. But I want to take you back to 2005 uh, to the uh, Kilo v. City of New London, Connecticut case, mm -hmm. a case that I personally uh, thought should have attracted more media attention, uh, media attention and debate um, in which the court radically expanded the scope of eminent domain. Do you think That's that, your characterization. That is my characterization. That it was not I Justice, I think it was Justice Stevens who wrote the decision. And what he said is that this is exactly what the founders contemplated mm. when they passed the eminent domain provision. And if you, and you certainly, the, the, the question was whether um, New London, Connecticut could seize property. These were a few houses. It actually was not a huge number of houses, but they needed to seize them, pay fair market value for them, and then use that property for a big water, waterfront development plan, much like the one that we're sitting in today. Right. Uh, and the court said, yes, you can do that. You don't have to do that. You can unelect the people who try to do that, but you have the constitutional power to do that. And I guess I would suggest to you that the reason it didn't become a big Megillah, to mm -hmm. use a, a, a legal phrase, <laughs> right. is, that, um, is that it doesn't happen that often, mm -hmm. and it very rarely happens in cases involving big commercial development. So, uh, because if it, if, if it was considered somehow by people in general to be an awful thing to do, they w politicians wouldn't do it. Here, politicians actually enacted a law aimed at uh, curbing excesses and too much political, too much corporate influence and union influence in elections. And the court said, we know better. And the Constitution doesn't allow that. And the Supreme Court just a few years earlier with a different majority had said a very different thing. So I think, and, and we've seen the consequences of that like them or not, we've just had over, I think, something like $4 billion spent on in an election, and that probably doesn't count everything uh, in the outside money that we don't know about and hasn't been all added up yet. So I think that the two are not comparable in terms of their effect on the populace and the system that we live under. You mentioned also uh, in your earlier presentation gay marriage, and of course, uh, in the last week, it's been a major uh, ruling. The Sixth Circuit has upheld a ban on gay marriage in what six six states? Four states. Four states. Excuse me. Uh, is it a fait accompli then that that SCOTUS will uh, hear this split among the circuits? Will we? I can we expect a big? I think case? I, I expect that's likely the outcome, although we could mention that there is the possibility 
that um, gay marriage advocates could appeal first to the full circuit. And if the full circuit were to overrule that panel, there still would be no conflict among the circuits. Correct. And, um, and there would be no reason for the Supreme Court to take the case. I mean, they didn't, after all, in the first week of October, the court declined to hear seven cases from five states and three circuit courts of appeal. And that led to the addition of something like 11 more states where gay marriage became, has become legal since then because those are the geographical areas covered by those appeals courts. And since then, in addition, the Ninth Circuit made a similar ruling. And once again, the losers, in this case, the state of Idaho, for example, tried to say, we're different. The Supreme Court said, no, you're not, essentially. We're leaving in place the Ninth Circuit. So we now have well over, I think, or at least we have well over two-thirds of the states now allow gay marriage. So query, let's say the court does hear this. There is a conflict, and the court goes to hear it, I think, probably next term, not, not this term. Uh, I can't figure out how they could undo what they've already done. In those states, gay marriage is very likely to remain legal because tens of thousands of people will have relied on the actions of the courts right. and the Supreme Court, will be married, and will, you can't unmarry them, so, uh, and you can't change the law now because then the new people who want to get married would, would be saying, in those states, well, we you can't deny us the equal protection, protection of right, the law. Exactly. So it's a quite I the, I think, you know, if I were a betting woman, mm -hmm. I'd say there must be five votes there because otherwise, mm -hmm. what are they going to do? Well, let me ask you about that. You, if you were a betting woman, have you ever been so sure of an outcome as you were covering a SCOTUS case, only to be floored? I've been outcome? floored, but I like to try not to be that sure. So that after the um, Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. the first round, we're about to have a second round of right. the Affordable Care Act. First round of Affordable Care Act, uh, the heavy betting odds were that the Obama administration would lose and that the court would strike the law down. And many of my colleagues really went out on a limb to say that. And I just was not going to do that because I've been around too long <laughs> to do that. And in the end, of course, the court, by a five to four vote, upheld the law and on different grounds than anybody would have predicted, on the tax grounds instead of the Commerce Clause grounds. And the fifth vote was not, as everybody thought it might be, Justice Kennedy. It was Chief Justice John Roberts. Let me ask you, uh, as a journalist, as someone who has to translate uh, legal language, uh, very sophisticated uh, legal uh, language uh, for a lay person, who do you think is the best, the, cl the cleanest, the clearest writer on the court? Well, there are different things as to this. I mean, I think that certainly the most vivid writer is Justice Scalia, without doubt. I agree. And um, but if I were to say the other clearest writers probably are Justice Ginsburg. And uh, we don't have enough of a track record with Chief Justice Roberts, but he's a very clear writer. I want to ask you about a, a case from the Roberts uh, court that I watched very closely as a former prosecutor. And it was a unanimous decision, U.S. v. Jones. Uh, that, in, that involved the surreptitious tracking uh, of an automobile by a GPS system. The last time the court had taken up a similar issue, it was a case involving beepers, right? Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, do you think that the court is current enough on technology to confront the kinds of cases that are coming before it? Well, I think probably not, but I think they're probably not current enough to make people of your age happy. Mm. But 
that doesn't mean they can't be current enough to decide the issue before the court. Right. So here, actually, and then last year in the cell phone case, they, the court ruled, and and uh, Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion saying, look, everybody's lives are on their cell phones. You can't search a cell phone, even when you arrest somebody, mm -hmm. without a search warrant. Going to a judge and getting permission to justify that search, because you can stop somebody on a traffic, you know, over a traffic uh, charge and search their phone if, if that person can be arrested. So you could, he said, you, you've, you're going to have to have a search warrant. And it was, my recollection is, it was unanimous. And so I'm sure that they can't use their cell phones the way somebody 20 uses his or her cell phone. Right. They're not hooked, they haven't got all, you know, all their music on it. <laughs> they haven't got, they can't find the place to eat dinner on it. None of that stuff. I would wager a fair amount that they can't. Uh, but that doesn't mean they can't decide the, the case. Job done. Right. Nina Totenberg, this has really been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. And everyone can read the interview with you in this week's Washington Jewish Week at WashingtonJewishWeek.com. Thank you again. Thank you for having this me. This is a pleasure. Thank you. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV on JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.